what has been called the crime and the trial of the century is over. The Yorkshire Ripper has been given a life sentence and the judge expressed the hope that the sentence really would mean Sutcliffe would stay in prison for life. A five-year manhunt, the biggest in British criminal history, is finished. But the questions raised by that manhunt and the subsequent trial of Peter Sutcliffe are by no means finished with. A jury has decided that the Ripper was a monster, not mad, but evil. But what lessons have we learned for the future? How efficient was the police hunt for the Ripper? What of the trial, which was to have been pushed through in three days until the judge sent for a jury and it took three weeks? And what of checkbook journalism and the behaviour of Fleet Street? There is also the question of the sentence and the role of psychiatrists in murder trials. Has this perhaps even changed the future of the charge of murder itself? The ending of the Ripper case has raised more issues of vital public concern than it's answered. Ronald Gregory is the Chief Constable of West Yorkshire Police Force. Mr and Mrs Leach are the parents of Barbara Leach, who was murdered by the Ripper in September 79. They've been at the trial in the Old Bailey and they've bravely agreed to come into our studio in Leeds tonight. Another parent, Mrs Doreen Hill, is the mother of Jacqueline, the Ripper's last victim in November last year. She's also been at the trial, but she's in our London studio because understandably she and her husband feel that they can't face the prospect of visiting Leeds or even Yorkshire after what has happened to them. Derek Jameson was the editor of the Daily Express and of The Star. David Yallop is a journalist and author who's made a special study of the Ripper case and whose book, Deliver Us From Evil, is now being rushed into print. Louis Blanc Cooper, QC, is a leading lawyer. Anthony Clare in London is a consultant psychiatrist. Bob Cryer is MP for Keithley up here in the north and has called for an inquiry into the police hunt for the Ripper and other aspects of the case. We also have in the studio Ronald Barker, who was a neighbour and friend of Sutcliffe and who, when he gave evidence at the trial, was forced to reveal that he'd taken money from newspapers. <coughs> First of all, if I can turn to you, Chief Constable, it is over. What would you say we, and more particularly you and your police force, have learned from it? We've learned that in a, a murder investigation of this magnitude, there is of necessity going to be a tremendous public involvement, some of it emotional, some hysterical, some of it misinformed, and there are opportunities for the police to be diverted from their main task of carrying out uh, this very serious inquiry. I think we have learned that we have got to be persistent and not to be diverted by the press or uninformed criticism, and I think that the men responsible for the inquiry just did that and carried on till the end. But were you diverted by the press? It's a, a, a rather astonishing accusation for a police force to make that uh, they were bent from the progress of their responsibilities by the activity of reporters. Well, they, they, we were on occasions because we were almost fighting the press on occasions because we could not always communicate with the public. The press, uh, it, it, is, um, it, it is not unknown, that uh, will not always print what we want them to print. Um, there were occasions when the public were led on a wild goose chase, they were printing confidential police circulations, they were publishing photo fits that we didn't want them to publish, and on a number of occasions um, we just found that there was so much pressure from the press and the media that we were, on occasion, diverted from the main task. Uh, was there any wild goose chase more wild than that that led the police to concentrate all its attention <coughs> on the voice recording and the fact that you issued instructions to all your policemen uh, to discount and eliminate from the inquiries anybody who didn't have a Geordie accent, th thus allowing the Ripper who didn't have a Geordie accent to go free for that much longer? No, that's not true. You see, that is a misstatement immediately. We did not n inform the force that they should reject anyone who didn't have an accent. The decision on the tape and the letters was taken after very careful consideration because at that time the senior investigating officers were in a dilemma. If they had kept the tapes and not revealed them to the public, then they might have been under much worse criticism than if they had revealed them. When they did reveal them, 
the police had to be positive and say what they thought about those tapes. There was evidence in those tapes, in the letters at the beginning, to suggest that the writer knew a lot about the murders, and there were even some predictions in those letters. That is why they were revealed, and that is why the public were told, we think that this man is the Ripper, and that he has that accent. But at no time was that the only point on which a suspect would be eliminated. But that was in a, a confidential report that's far from confidential now, because it's been mentioned a number of times in a number of places. Uh, the, the word eliminated uh, is your word, the word discounted was mine. But you were eliminating people uh, who didn't have a wearside accent. No, not solely on that. That was one of the, the ways in which they could be discounted or eliminated, whichever way you want to yes. describe it. But there were many other ways in which a suspect could be eliminated. Mrs. Hill, do you now feel, uh, with the final stages of this tragedy, having uh, gone through today, able to um, say, well, it's over uh, and I have no more recriminations? I'm not quite sure what you exactly mean by that. Well, do, do you feel content to leave things as they now are, or do you feel still sore and angry about both the police activity and the press behaviour during the five years? Well, there are a couple of aspects about the police I'm not too happy about. Certain factors, with hindsight, now appear clear, but you know, that occurs afterwards. There's one bit that did worry me, um, a sort of lack of liaison, I believe, between the police sections in Leeds at the time of Jacqueline's murder. The handbag was found on the Monday evening. When the detectives went to where Jacqueline's body was, they knew nothing at all about that handbag. Could Mr Gregory clarify that? Mr. Gregory? When the detectives, and I can't remember exactly just what happened when the detectives went there, I know that the handbag had been found and was being dealt with by the uniform branch for that area. I, I cannot r I, I answer that with any accuracy, whether the detectives knew about the handbag at that time. Mrs. Leach, how do you now feel about the police activity uh, that surrounded these murders? Um, well, I just wondered um, how many pointers there were to Sutcliffe being the murderer um, before the tapes and the letter uh, were made public? Can you answer that now? Yes, before the tape and the tape and the letters were received, there was no evidence uh, to connect Sutcliffe with the crimes. In fact, there has never been any evidence to connect Sutcliffe with the crimes until he was arrested. He was never in the category of a main suspect. There were 40, 50, sometimes 80 men who were under close suspicion because of answers they'd given to inquiries. But despite the fact that Sutcliffe was interviewed a number of times, despite the fact that his, his car was seen in prostitute areas, there was never any tangible evidence to connect him with those crimes. Otherwise, you can be quite sure he would have been arrested. Not even the, the fact that he'd um, uh, been caught carrying um, a hammer early on. 1969. 1969. Ah, well, <coughs> that, that was when he was uh, convicted of going equipped to, uh, to break into a house, you mean. On his record, it, was, it merely said, going equipped to steal. It was, there was not on his record at that time that he, was in, that he was in possession of a hammer. One of your own officers filed a report about 18, 18 months ago naming Sutcliffe as the Ripper, though. No, he didn't. I have seen that report. The officers who went to see Sutcliffe said they were not happy with him. And they were not the only officers who said they were not happy with the way he answered their questions. They were not happy about his attitude and drew this to the, att to the attention of senior officers. But despite that, when officers went again to see him, they searched his, his garage, they searched his house, they searched his car, they examined his clothing, they questioned his wife, 
She gave him alibis. They could not find any evidence to connect him. And let me emphasize this. He was not the only one at that time who was under scrutiny. There were some men who were under personal surveillance for quite a bit of time. Bob Cryer, you called <coughs> earlier in public for uh, an inquiry into the police conduct of uh, this unprecedentedly complicated and enormous case. Do you feel now as you did then? Yes, I do. You see, I don't think the Chief Constable's adequately answered the point about a constable making a recommendation. And I think that, of course, everybody willed and wanted the police to get this man as soon as humanly possible. And everybody is on the side of the police in this sort of detection. But, you see, I think there are a number of questions. And if a constable sends in a report, which apparently uh, was filed for no action, and which from the re reports that we read uh, uh, pointed very strongly, and it was a judgment of, a, of an officer uh, to Sutcliffe, then I think it must be frustrating for men on the beat to re receive this sort of blank wall attitude, or what would appear to them to be blank wall attitude. Now that points, I think, to a lack of communication, and the basis, as I'm sure the Chief Constable would agree, of successful policing is the man on the beat. And in fact, he was detected by routine patrolmen on the beat. And I think that it's very important to examine just what oversights were made in this sort of area. Do you now, still I, so, uh, if Sorry, I can just on. say that, that, the, that the police have said they're going to conduct their own examination. Now, I think we ought to have an outside inquiry into this case. It's a, a extraordinarily expensive. I think the, the, the publicity in the trial and <coughs> accompanying the trial has thrown up a number of pointers that I think need investigation, because if there were blunders, we've got to learn lessons. It was the most expensive and the biggest police investigation ever, and we want the police to be effective in deterring crime, and that means that they must be efficient in detecting and uh, subsequently prosecuting. So I want an outside body because I'm not confident. I mean, Who, the chief for instance? Well, I mean... <sighs> A select committee of parliament, although the uh, legislation, the 64 Police Act, under which the Home Secretary could institute an inquiry, uh, the Home Secretary could appoint an eminent uh, judge, for example, uh, or an eminent person in public life. Uh, but somebody, I mean, I would draw the line actually at a judge. I'd like to see somebody mm. in public life who was divorced, as it were, from legal circumstances and from the police. Would you, um, would you welcome that? You've, you've spoken earlier this evening of an inquiry that you as Chief Constable will conduct. Doesn't that make you vulnerable to the accusation that you're going to conduct, as a policeman, an inquiry into police affairs? Wouldn't you welcome an outside inquiry? Oh, I would not be resentful of an inquiry at all. Um, I, 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 my conscience is clear and I'm, I'm happy with, with most aspects of the inquiry, but whenever we're engaged in, a, in any operation, and certainly an investigation of that length, we would certainly be looking critically at our own methods and procedures. But can I just mention this? It is a distortion to say that the officers came in and made a recommendation about Sutcliffe and that was ignored or thrown back to them. It was not. It mm -hmm. most certainly was not. Those officers said they were just not happy about him and therefore a further investigation was made and a further interview was made by other officers. Mrs Hill in London, can I ask you if you would welcome an inquiry into the way the police conducted uh, the investigation? Yes, I would welcome an inquiry. If it's going to be a police inquiry, well, can I see the detailed report? Would, you, would Mrs Hill, in such an inquiry, be invited to uh, contribute her views and, and to see the details of, of, of the report? If Mrs Hill was, or, or is still, dissatisfied with any aspect of the investigation, if she would like to come and see us at any time, we could explain to her exactly what has happened. You see, the public and so many commentators have criticised the police when they have not, not seen exactly what the police have done. I've heard criticisms earlier this evening about people who have questioned the police, but they have not been privy to all the extent of police inquiries and investigations. And until they are, then I think they should reserve full judgment or criticism. Can I ask you a, a, a simple question, which no doubt you'll tell me I'm wrong <coughs> to think of? Uh, Mrs. Hill is, and Mrs. Leach and the other parents are in entirely privileged positions. Could you not have sent for them earlier? and set their minds at rest 
uh, they're hardly going to go and um, interfere with the progress of the trial by talking about it. You've, you've now offered, uh, it seems to me, wisely, and I'm sure the public will endorse it, to, to see Mrs Hill and anybody else who has queries. Could you not have uh, reassured them earlier? Well, I, I didn't know what their queries were or what they wanted to be reassured about. This is the first I've heard mm. that they wanted to be reassured. And before the trial, I didn't want to interfere with, with the, the sort of evidence they were likely to give. David Yellow, what do you feel of what you've heard? Some amazement. Why? Um, we've heard the Chief Constable castigate the press, the public, but yet... Really, Chief Constable, you see no error in the five-and-a-half-year investigation? No, no serious error? Well, uh, there may have been errors. I would not say we were infallible at all, but I heard your earlier comments upon the case, and I would say that you are not informed of what the police did. I know that you visited the headquarters and you, you interviewed uh, some of the officers, but you have not yet got full information of what the police did. I, I'm fully informed of what they didn't do. They didn't catch for five and a half years Peter Sutcliffe. Oh, I know they didn't do that. That's pretty obvious. But uh, I'm, I'm glad also that you welcome, um, or seem to endorse in a way, a, a public inquiry that Mr. Cry has raised. No, I, I didn't say that. I said I would, I would not resent an inquiry into what the police did. Who did the inquiry and how it was conducted, I think, would be important mm. to the public. It's very difficult, of course, to look into police methods by, or for someone who is not conversant with, with the investigation to critically examine police methods. But you see, you criticised earlier the press. I, and I'm not going to take the brief of the press. I'm not um, a reporter. Um, I think the press could well be subjected to some considerable criticism over the last five and a half years. But nevertheless, uh, an analysis of that five and a half year press treatment clearly indicates to me that they were enormously useful to you as well. Would you accept that? On occasions, yes, of course they were. But you see, the press, the press do not acknowledge that they, that they need to support the police or need to, to be the, uh, the mouthpiece for the, for the police. Uh, and I, I accept that. I, I don't ex accept that everything will be accepted, that the press will accept everything we do. But there was extreme difficulty. If we called a press conference, uh, then uh, there were some who were not there and said they'd been excluded. There were complaints and criticisms. There were criticisms that we were not revealing sufficient information to the press, that we should have revealed the tapes earlier and things like that. And when they didn't get it revealed, they found it by other means and uh, got possession of confidential police documents. But journalists and reporters will always find it by other means if you uh, suppress that, because I think that journalists and reporters take a view that you are accountable oh, to the certainly. public. certainly, but it is irresponsible to publish information which is going to assist us in the inquiry. Can I, do you, do can I raise a question? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, David Yarrow. Uh, the one point that we're about to bypass, and I want to uh, take David Yarrow's point to Derek Jameson as well, uh, is the fact that the Ripper was interviewed that number of times. He was <coughs> in your system in a number of ways. Is it possible that this thing snowballed into a kind of monster administration which got out of hand and defeated you, de defeated good detective work, because you hadn't programmed it to sing out its suspicions when the cross-referencing in several categories showed that the name Sutcliffe was cropping up in connection with the money, in connection with motor cars in red light districts, in connection with uh, footprints, in connection with tire prints, a number of categories in which Sutcliffe was, uh, as you say, I gather, in the frame, he became more and more in the frame. Did that computer of yours, or that system of yours, not sing out? The, the, the system showed, and it has properly documented, the number of times that Sutcliffe was seen in the prostitute areas, the number of times that he was interviewed. He was interviewed, or he was seen, I think it was three interviewers, but he was seen on five occasions about the five pound note. He was seen on two or three occasions about sightings of two motor cars that he had. And he was questioned about the five pound note. Now, certainly he was the same man that was interviewed in, in several aspects of the inquiry. <coughs> but there was still no evidence to connect him. Uh, policemen were unhappy about him. Uh, more than one policeman was unhappy about him. But it's, it's all right being unhappy about a man, but finding the evidence is another matter. And there were other men who were connected with sightings 
mm. with the, who lived in the five pound note area and so on. Definitely. Derek Jameson. Well, um, I'm glad Mr. Gregory has been critical of the press because I needn't be shy about saying that this is, was, perhaps the biggest balls up in police history. It was totally and utterly mishandled from A to Z. And if we ever get to the bottom of it and the truth of it, it will probably be in a newspaper. It will be up to journalists to find out what exactly happened. Here we had a man who had been done in 1969 for possession of a hammer, who had been cited over 50 times in the red light districts, who had been questioned up to nine times by the police. He said he lost count. Who's the five pound note paid to a prostitute was traced back to Clark Transport where he worked. Every time, again, 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 Sutcliffe, 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 and he wasn't even in the top 40 suspects. Now, I believe there's something wrong there. I want to know the answer to those questions. What did go wrong? Was there incompetence? Was there any... I don't know. Maybe the police... The police have got an answer for everything today. Do you accept Mr. Hobson the, do you and accept Mr. Gregory, the they have an answer for everything. But the public's got a thousand questions out there. They want to know the answers to those questions. Do and I can put them tonight. Well, we've got to take a break now. And uh, we'll come back with some of those questions after the break. Welcome back. Derek Jameson, you have a vigorous attitude, to put it uh, mildly, think, yeah, towards the police in, in, yes. in, in this matter. Yeah, I think, I think got to speak well, your If mind. I can put something to you, right at the beginning, the Chief Constable said that the activity and behaviour of the pre press actually got in the way of his investigation. I'm not making any apologies for the behaviour of the press tonight. The entire British press, plus television, spent something less than £15,000. The police spent £4 million of the taxpayers' money, a million man-hours, and if Sutcliffe had not got the wind up and put up false number plates, he'd still be out there tonight doing his dirty deeds. That's what caught him. So I'm not apologising for the 15000 Every picture you have seen tonight is checkbook journalism, was paid for at a premium to get those pictures to the public. And if we have to spend money turning up stones, finding out what really happened, then we will spend money. Well, you've moved to checkbook journalism. Mrs Hill, you raised the issue in the first instance of checkbook journalism. What's more, you wrote to the Queen about it. Uh, do you feel uh, that there is any merit in Derek Jameson's defence of uh, the purchase of journalistic material? Well, I don't agree with the principle of checkbook journalism. People should give the information free. Well, Derek Jameson. Preferably, yes, indeed. I'd like Mrs. Hill, I have every sympathy for you, you know, and I would like, rather we didn't pay for it. But believe me, after 35 years in the business, there are times when you have to pay. When but Mr. Birdsall went to the police and said, Sutcliffe is the ripper, and they sent him home, I want to know exactly what they said to him, what he said, what happened, why he went home, why he believed the Geordie tape. He was told, oh, the Geordie is the ripper. You know, I want to know what happened. If I have to pay £500 to discover what happened, that's £500 well spent. But why do you have to pay? Should it not perhaps be well, the responsibility of a journalist to persuade people to, well, take it, to talk in the public interest yeah, rather than to go there, out like accountants? There are two factors there, as you well know, uh, Mr Wilcox, because you've been in the business yourself. There are two <laughs> factors. One... I've never been one, in the business of buying a story. Ah, Grant, how beautiful you are. Uh, there are two factors. One, the public has an inflated idea that there's money in this for me. You know, as I said, if a gas cooker explodes in the high street, they think, oh, yes, you want a picture, how much will you pay? So there's always the public feel that they can make money out of this. The other factor, I'll be quite honest, is the competition. You know, the, these newspapers are all fighting each other for the best story. And because but of the competition... But if they agreed, like a strategic arms limitation agreement, if they agreed not to pay... Do you think the 15,000 was a terrible thing? I mean, does the public have it? We spent 15,000. Do you know how much a, a one-minute commercial cost on that television I mean, th tonight? Th this is a gross distortion of what actually happened. It wasn't just 15,000. There was a queue of newspapers uh, outside uh, various relatives' houses offering sums of up to 100,000 for exclusive story. And pictures. I think there's a and difference pictures. between, uh, say, r meeting reasonable costs for some relative who, uh, uh, who's producing information on a, uh, a story that's being ferreted out and offering £50,000 for some exclusive story. And I do think that we've got to have some sort of limitation 
So that, for example, <coughs> instead of a queue of eager relatives of a criminal who's convicted of a serious charge benefiting, that any payments are made to uh, the Criminal in Injuries Compensation Board or to, or to the Legal Aid Fund. Mrs Hill, how would you accept that? Well, personally, I wouldn't want any money. No, but would you feel that if newspapers felt that they had to pay for the stories they were getting from those connected, for instance, with the, uh, the murderer's family, that the, the money that was paid went to some independent and charitable uh, condition? I don't see why the newspapers should have to pay. If people want to give a story, let them give it free. I don't mind. Mrs is, Leach, can I ask Mrs oh. Leach? What's your feeling? <coughs> well, I feel that uh, if they're going to pay uh, for the story, they should give double the amount as well to mm. the... Um, fund for the victims of... Desmond, you, I mean, it's, it's only one of the symptoms of our society. We live in a capitalist society where people are conditioned and trained for a profit motive. You're seeing one illustration of it, and you're objecting to that. I mean, one could take many industries and find the same well, what, motivation, what motivation of money. I'm, I'm pursuing the point that was raised both by Bob Cryer and Mrs Hill, uh, was rather vigorously debated between the editor of the Daily Mail and Buckingham Palace when the yeah. letter from the Queen uh, was released, uh, was talked about in public by the Attorney General as reinforcing his thoughts for a bill that's presently in front of Parliament to restrict the powers of the press. Now, Derek Jameson, is it possible that you've brought upon yourself restrictions that you may now find very irksome? I can understand public concern. This has been going on for donkey's years, but it's come out into the open. During the Thorpe Affair, there was the same outcry about checkbook journalism, with Desmond Wilcox well to the forefront. But <laughs> it's, it's, it's dwarfed into insignificance against the questions raised by the Ripper case, the fact that newspapers pay money. As I say, every time you look at a picture of Sutcliffe, a newspaper or television station has paid big money for it. Well, I'm happy that to say that the largest television. sum of money that Yorkshire Television has paid on this programme, and it's modest at that, is your own fee. I was going to say, they're paying me, that's checkbook oh, journalism, oh, not much, mind you. Mr. Mr. Barker, you're here because... Not only were you a friend and neighbour of the Ripper, not only did you give evidence at the trial, but you expected to make money out of your knowledge of him. Indeed, you did make some money. Now, I gather that you're a bit discontented that the People newspaper are now not following through with the, the <coughs> promises they made to you. Well, not indirectly. Um, what on was the first morning that uh, we found out that it was Peter Silkley? Uh, Several reports from the sun came down to our house and uh, asked me what I thought of the person next door. How much did you make altogether? Well, can I go into that first? I mean, is it true to say that you uh, you made 500 plus 65 pounds a week expenses no. uh, from the people and then no, you were expecting no. another 400? No. You've got the wrong person wrong there. 700, 700, 700. Precisely what... Uh, <coughs> The Sun paid 700 pounds for The Sun paid 700 The Sun paid 700 for, for Yes, I'm sorry. I, first I actually read the fees paid to Trevor <coughs> Birdsell, whom you yes, yeah. know, and it was part of the same uh, social yeah. gang, if it but can be called. Uh, with regard to the press, and with regard to Mr Gregory's force as well, it's not a much more serious issue to be discussed, the business of contempt, for example. I mean, it's a different issue, but in terms of the, you, the morality one that you're talking about is open-ended forever. Mm. I mean, if Fleet Street comes over the top of the Pennines like Lemmings, as they did, Mm. knocking at his front door. I'm yes. afraid that a young man like Mr Barker doesn't, uh, at school, get a crash course on how to cope with Fleet Street. Where do you see the, the, the most outrageous forms of contempt, then? I think, with due respect to the Chief Constable, it began yeah. with the press conference of January the 4th. I can understand your jubilation, and I think we all share that. I think it was singularly unfortunate and uh, very lacking in judgment for the euphoria that you felt to spill over onto the screen because it did open the door and once that door was open Fleet Street the radio television I mean the following day the Evening Standard committed gross criminal libel with a photograph now it could have been crucial identification in, in this case nobody knew at that point you may have been calling Olive Smelt or whatever I don't think it was an excuse for what the press did next d next day. Do you regret that conference? Uh, but but let, let me ask you, what part of that conference do you think was euphoric? When I think you, when you, you, you said, you said uh, we're winding uh, down inquiries. You said uh, we... Uh, no, I don't think that You was. mentioned the word ripper and you said delighted. 
uh, no, several times. What, can I just explain what happened? I mean, I'm, I'm told that senior officers of yours advised you against having the press conference and would have preferred you to issue a short mm. statement which would have been under, well no. understood by Fleet Steed. No, that's not true. That's not true. What happened was that when I got to Dewsbury Police Station that night, the press had obviously been tipped off or got to know that this man had been brought from Sheffield and was being interviewed by the Ripper team. Outside Jewsbury Police Station, there were, well, we estimated about 250 pressmen and photographers who were harassing everyone who went into that station and everyone who came out, and who were calling for some statement of some description. They were all saying, we know you've got him and all this sort of thing. So we called a press conference so that we could, we could tell them what had happened. I told them in that press conference that a serious charge was imminent. Now, they said to me, Will you be scaling down the inquiry? Well, I said a serious charge was imminent, and I knew that the man would be charged with one of the murders. So it followed that if he was going to be charged with at least one of the murders, we would certainly scale down the inquiry so far as that was concerned. Now, it was called a euphoric press conference because I said I was delighted with progress so far. That's about the most that I said. There was a picture taken of us laughing, and well, anyone knows if they're contact well, with photographers what can happen wh wh when, when they are... Well, let me, let me bring in Louis Blom Cooper now, if I can, on, on the issue of contempt. Mm. But also, if, if I can move you on from that, to the wider issue of the sentence that the Rippers received. Uh, do you feel that there are uh, aspects of both the uh, investigation, the arrest, and the trial uh, that disturb you uh, as a lawyer in terms of contempt or any other way? I think disturb would be putting it a bit high. I think there are aspects of the case which deserve our uh, scrutiny and, 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 and debate about them. I think contempt is one of them, and uh, with deference to the Chief Constable, uh, I think I did see on television the press conference that he held, and I think the impression that was given was a very clear one, is we've got the chap, hurrah! And it seemed to me that that constituted, and it's not for me to say so, but it seemed to me to constitute a contempt of court. Whether it, whether it turns out to be or not, I, I don't know. But that was the impression that was given. I, I may be wrong and other people may be wrong, but that's the impression that was given. So far as the uh, sentence is concerned, and I think this involves the whole question of the Attorney General's original uh, acceptance of the plea of diminished responsibility. I think I would, uh, on the whole, defend the Attorney General. You see, what's the purpose of the criminal justice system? It is to uh, fix criminal responsibility on the person who committed the crime and then uh, uh, deal with him appropriately. That is to say, if he's a very dangerous man, to lock him up. Now, if, he, uh, if the plea of diminished responsibility and manslaughter had been accepted, almost inevitably the judge would have passed a uh, life imprisonment and the result would be exactly the same as it is today after a three-week trial which has resulted in a conviction of murder and also a life sentence. So I think the Attorney General said to himself, look, all the psychiatrists are agreed, that's including the psychiatrists who were hired by the Crown, one of them being from the prison medical service himself, mm -hmm. so that he was saying they're all agreed, they're unanimous. Secondly, this is an enormous cost having a three-week trial uh, to what good purpose is it? Now, I think I can say the good purpose would be that the British public would have a great deal of it revealed in the proper process, and that's the advantage that we've had of three weeks. But he would have said to himself, on the other hand, enormous amount of time and money expended at a time when we're spending a lot of money on legal aid. Uh, this wasn't warranted in view of the fact that all the psychiatrists agreed that he was uh, a diminished responsibility and manslaughter was the If right he road. felt that way about the psychiatrists, and understanding that it was his professional duty in mm. court to test their evidence, would it not be true to say that he rather more vigorously than the professional duty would call for tested their evidence? Indeed, Hugo Milne, who was the leading mm. uh, psychiatric witness in the case, has said uh, that in fact he's uh, feeling very bitter about his experience in court, and he actually accuses the Attorney General and the prosecution of having been both hypocritical and deceitful in, a, in as much that they first accepted the psychiatric evidence, they agreed to uh, what amounted to plea bargaining, I suppose, or a plea arrangement, uh, uh, and the diminished plea, uh, and then came hard on Hugo Milne as though he'd got it all wrong.
Well, I, I can understand uh, Dr. Milne's reaction, and I sympathize with it. But I think the Attorney General was in a difficult position, you see, having, as it were, made the bargain mm. with the defense, and then the judge declining to accept it. He then had a trial on his hands. So once he had a trial on his hands, he naturally had to adopt the position of a prosecutor. And of course, the difference being that the doctors then became the witnesses for the defense. They weren't anymore mm. the Crown's witnesses as they originally were. And so it would, have, it would have looked even sillier if, in fact, he'd got up and said, uh, well, I'm not going to cross-examine Dr. Milne, I accept all mm. he says, because people would say, well, what's the purpose of having this trial then? So but I think he was pushed into the position, ultimately, although I, I quite concede that his action in the trial looks to be inconsistent yes. with his attitude uh, when he was accepting the... Would you accept a harsher word than inconsistent? Because you've used the <laughs> word bargain. Uh, is it the sort of bargain, given particularly the public notoriety of this case and the public interest in this case, uh, that ought to take place? Uh, is it good for justice, for something that may well be labelled shabby, to have been attempted? Well, I think, quite honestly, we cannot, in this day and age, run a criminal justice system unless we do have plea bargaining. Well, uh, the whole system would simply break down if every case had to go for trial and prosecutors couldn't accept pleas to lesser offences. On the other hand, I think this perhaps was that one exceptional case where you'd say, well, never mind, ordinarily we would have accepted a plea. This is the one case where the public interest is so enormous that we ought to let it simply go for trial. And it may be that the Attorney General's judgment was faulty, but I don't think one can say more than that. Right. Anthony but, Clare, can I ask Anthony Clare in London, uh, as a psychiatrist, do you feel uh, that the progress of this trial and the treatment of the uh, psychiatric experts, the, the psychiatrists who gave evidence, uh, has endangered or brought into debate at least the role of psychiatrists in such trials in, in the future? Well, it's focused attention on the role of uh, psychiatrists in cases such as this, although it has to be said this is a very unusual case. I think I would uh, feel a certain sympathy with the three psychiatrists who participated in this trial because, in a sense, it highlights the problem of uh, a specialty such as psychiatry, which is resting on relatively insubstantial foundations, being hauled into a complex legal system with bargaining and with issues of diminished responsibility and with alleged differences in outcome, uh, and then finding, in fact, that when the, law, when the rules of the game change somewhat, as they did over this issue of plea bargaining, that they suddenly become, if you like, uh, the, uh, the objects of uh, the cross-examination. Um, it's also a little irritating, I think it's true to say professionally, because in many instances, and this is one, the actual outcome it does not hinge on the psychiatric evidence, though the public are often led to believe it does. In the case of this man, Sutcliffe, there seems to me to be widespread legal and psychiatric agreement, and I listened carefully to Louis Blom Cooper, and he seemed to agree with this, that whether, in fact, the jury had found in favour of a diminished responsibility plea or not, the outcome would almost certainly have been the same in practical terms. That is, a life sentence uh, and uh, uh, the chances of uh, this man's release being extremely doubtful. So that at the end of the day, psychiatry has been in the dock. The psychiatric basis for uh, the diagnosis has been uh, uh, so minutely examined as to reveal the inevitable ambiguities of some of these diagnoses, and the psychiatrists have been left uh, licking their wounds, and I would think some of them vowing never to return to uh, yeah. that kind of trial again. With some sort of damage, perhaps, to uh, public confidence in psychiatrists in future, because if the public, reading as they will have done, uh, miles of evidence day after day, which appears to uh, slowly chip away at the careful and experienced diagnoses of uh, senior psychiatrists, how do the public then feel about trusting the word of psychiatrists when, for instance, it might be given as a recommendation for release after some years in jail, uh, if not for Sutcliffe, for somebody similar? Well, I, I, I think that's unlikely, but uh, taking your point about public confidence, uh, there have been many cases, uh, Desmond, you know, where psychiatrists have disagreed, as indeed where medical witnesses in general have disagreed. What was unusual about this case 
I think a little unexpected, I must say, as a psychiatrist observing it, but then I'm not privy to the absolute details and to the mental state examination and so on. But what was unusual, and perhaps even through the Attorney General a little, was that three psychiatric experts agreed on a diagnosis. And indeed, they agreed and they stuck to that agreement uh, for some considerable time. That was unusual. And in that sense, you're right that uh, it's not just that psychiatrists disagreed, about which the public are well aware, but there's, uh, there must be some public doubt about the nature of psychiatry when psychiatrists themselves actually agree on a diagnosis and a jury throws it out. As against that, of course, I think it's important to read what the judge said today. And it seemed to me that he was asking the jury to decide on what he called the balance of probabilities about whether the psychiatrists were uh, right to place such faith in what they'd been told as they did. And in those circumstances, I think that was a very reasonable direction to the jury. And in the circumstances, I think Certainly I, as a psychiatrist, have to admit and readily do that the basis for psychiatric uh, statements is much flimsier than perhaps the law would wish it to be, and that lawyers, for their own purposes, often demand from psychiatrists much clearer statements about responsibility and about illness than psychiatrists are often able to give. Mr. Leach, uh, during the course of the nearly three weeks that this trial has lasted, much detailed and horrific evidence has been brought forward, which must have caused great shock and distress to you and your wife. Uh, that had to happen the moment the plea bargain we talked about was dropped and the trial had to go the full length. Nevertheless, uh, do you regret that? Would you rather have seen a three-day trial or a three-week trial? No, I, I'd, uh, I, I would have. Uh, I preferred the, a, a three-week trial because uh, I, I wanted to know what, what, what had happened to my daughter. Uh, I'd, I'd formed my own theories, and the, and the facts that I heard at, at the trial uh, confirmed uh, basically what, what, what I, I, I thought had happened. And uh, I'd, I'd rather learn uh, to live with, with the facts rather than to. Uh, to try, um, to, uh, to try to think in, in the future, for the rest of the rest of my life, what, what, what might have happened. Mrs Hill, is that your feeling? No, I would rather not have known the facts, to be quite honest. But I think the judge was right in the very beginning, when he wouldn't accept guilty to attempted murders and then not guilty to the others. He was right. Can, can I, uh, at this stage, uh, bring in David Yallop again? David Yallop, uh, has what you've heard reassured some of the fiercely held criticisms that you were expressing earlier? Not at all. I mean, for example, the, your, our friend down the line speaking on behalf of all psychiatry, I'm clear, sure, yes. Um, I'd like to ask him a question. Confronted with a situation of a man like Sutcliffe, and you're examining him, when you have access to a mass of external information, the very long, detailed police report, taken over some 15 and a half, 16 hours, access to his GP, access to his friends, would you do what your colleagues did, which was take and arrive at a conclusion based entirely on one source of information, namely Peter Sutcliffe? Well, straight answer to your question is no, I wouldn't. Thank you very much. Let me, uh, Chief Constable, ask you something. Sutcliffe's now in jail. We're told uh, that there were many more crimes than the 20 that were on the charge sheets, the 13 murders and the seven attempted murders, uh, which were considered as probably being the work of Sutcliffe. This is, I understand, natural in such cases, uh, but the suspicions that uh, your detectives held were, were pretty fierce. Is it likely that Sutcliffe is going to be interviewed some more by your police force is it then likely that some other files are going to be closed, or perhaps that Sutcliffe reappears in the dock again? Well, whether or not he appears in the dock again would not be a matter for me. It would be a matter, say, for the uh, Director of Public Prosecutions. I'm certain that some other police forces, some other senior detective officers, would want to interview Sutcliffe about matters which have not um, been looked into at the present time. Um, I think we had enough to be going on with, uh, with this prosecution, and it was the wish of the Director of Public Prosecutions that he should not be further interviewed whilst he was awaiting trial. But there were similarities. You know, it has been mentioned, the, the murder in Lancashire. Mm. That will still be investigated. It was strange. There were so many similarities about that one. 
and I must confess that we thought that he was probably responsible for that as well. There were some dissimilarities. But you see, there were some dissimilarities with some of the murders he's admitted. He started to uh, use rope, for example. Yes. And uh, uh, there were so many aspects of, of this case which were not straightforward and caused concern both to the Manchester police, the Lancashire police, and we've had inquiries from, from Scotland and all parts of the country. There will certainly be further inquiries. Louis Blanc Cooper, he's been sentenced. <coughs> We've heard what the judge says. How real is that? The public tonight, macabre though it may sound, will want to speculate uh, on how long Sutcliffe's going to be locked away from society. They will want, in fact, reassurance. Well, life imprisonment means life imprisonment, and he can't be released until a Home Secretary allows him to be released, of course, on licence. And, I mean, I would just simply say it will be a very brave Home Secretary who allows this man to come out at any time before he's a pretty old man. Um, you can say effectively that nobody would release him, I think. You can fairly say for 20 years, and I think thereafter he may go on being But detained. he said 20 years. The judge said 30. Well, the judge said that's only a recommendation. It has no legal effect at all. It's entirely a matter of the Secretary of State on a recommendation from the parole board, which he doesn't have to accept, whether and when he releases any man. And uh, some, of the, some of the people viewing tonight will remember a man called Straffen, who uh, uh, was twice convicted. Uh, Straffen has now been in, I think, something like 27 years uh, since he was convicted. I think people who remain dangerous uh, and have committed uh, horrendous crimes, and they can't be considered anything less than that, yes. will stay in for a very, very long time. Whether it is, in fact, actually the rest of their natural lives is a matter that one can't project right that far into the future. Mrs. Hill, how do you feel about the sentence? Well, I would prefer him to stay in prison forever, to be quite honest. I don't want him ever let out again. Mrs. Leach? I feel the same way, absolutely. Do you not think that there might be a time in the future when he is a changed man because of incarceration? I think no matter how well he behaves, he's forfeited the right to come back into society. That's absolutely forever. Mr. Leach? Yeah, I, I agree with, with, with my wife entirely. I, I'd, I'd like, I, I would have liked to hear the judge uh, recommend just, uh, 50 years rather than 32. So, so he, he would certainly be an uh, old man if, if he ever came out again. Thank you very much indeed. The issues raised by the hunt for the Ripper and by the manner of his trial will undoubtedly have far-reaching repercussions and go on being discussed long after the debate in this studio tonight. We're grateful to everyone who's taken part in tonight's discussion, but we're particularly mindful of the courage that it must have taken for Mr and Mrs Leach and Mrs Hill in London to talk in public tonight. And I think our thoughts finally must be with them and all the other relatives of the Ripper's victims. From Leeds, good night.